Hi everyone, I'm Lizzie Lack and thank you for joining us today for this installment of Technically Creative, where we interview alumni who are pursuing artistic and creative endeavors. Today I'm so excited to have on George Levert. George is a photographer who has traveled all over the world, 80 plus countries that we're going to talk about, um, after a long and successful career in venture capital. So George, how are you today? Just fine. Great to see you. Great to see you, Lizzie. Yeah, great to see you too. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to chat with you about everything you've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> so first I want to talk to you about kind of like the beginning. You're a Georgia Tech Arts Advisory Board member. You've been a longtime champion of the arts in Atlanta as well as Georgia Tech. But I learned that you didn't pick up a camera or didn't start seriously pursuing it until you were 50. Can you kind of take me back on this journey to how you started and to where you are now? Yes, well, um, my wife and I started traveling around the world when I was 50 years old and covered mostly Europe for uh, a number of years. And then all of a sudden there was this explosion that happened uh, when I got to be about 65 years old. And um, what had happened is I, we, we did all the extensive traveling and I was, I had a point and shoot camera most of the time and uh, people gave me clues. They said, George, your photographs are really different than ours. And um, then we, my wife and I took an around the world trip in, in, in 2013 that was sponsored by the Smithsonian and it was called Extraordinary Cultures. And we went to nine different places the trip was like 20, 24 days long. And I suddenly saw this incredible opportunity for several things. I think adventure and discovery and photography. And so this really was the, the great launch point for getting serious about photography, about buying better equipment, about taking lessons, getting actually getting a coach and um, and beginning to target places that just have incredible photographic opportunity. Um, and so it's, 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 it's all of those things wrapped up in my photography. And I know you sent me, we've talked about it, you sent me a list of, of all the countries. I have it in front of me because I wanted to kind of see everywhere you've been. Um, can you share the I'd say top five places. Can you even pick a top five of where you've been? Well, uh, the one that I'll start with was the the place that I went in 2013, right after that around the world. Um, it's Papua New Guinea, which is in the South Pacific, not too far away from, well, it's a four hour flight from Australia. Um, and it's inhabited by a, a set of really hundreds of tribes and they are the most exotic people I've ever seen in any given place. They have uh, incredible costumes that they build out of native materials which include the plumage of uh, birds of paradise and then they use ferns and they use shells and they use mud and they use a lot of paint and they have this get together called a sing sing and you go and it's just like this explosion of exotic culture. And the neat thing is they love to have their picture made. <laughs> and so I had this, 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 and I have been to, you know, probably 20 different exotic places since then. Mm -hmm. That still is the one that lingers in my memory as uh, someone pulling a curtain back and saying, wow, you know, this is, this is something that's uh, extraordinary. And then I think the opportunity to go to places like Mongolia and, and, this incredible culture that's there, uh, to go into uh, Weizhou province in China where they preserve the ancient way of living, Chinese living, mm -hmm. um, those, and then going into Africa and go to visit the various tribes, the Samburu and the Maasai and these different tribes and, and go to some of their cultural uh, festivals and see their this incredible uh, costume design that they, has evolved over hundreds and hundreds of years. And it shows texture and color and pattern 
that would be extraordinary in New York City. It's so it's human skill is not in in those sorts in art is not exclusive to advanced civilization. It has been with us forever. And it's the sort of things you discover if you travel the world. And so, like I said, this, this business of adventure and discovery is tantamount to my interest in photography. Would you say that your career, your studies, your experience at Georgia Tech, everything that has kind of led you up to this point, do you find that you you bring that into your photography? Does it influence you in any way, or is there more of a, a separation of that? It's, it's a piece of it. Um, when you go on one of these photographic expeditions to a really isolated place in the world, mm -hmm. you're only going to have this, this opportunity one time. If you don't get the photo that day in that place, and you know it's gone forever because I'm never going to get back there. Right. And so being a great deal of planning goes into these things, uh, and then a great deal of kind of organization uh, so that you've got everything where it needs to be, when it needs to be. So preparation is a, 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 is essential. Yeah. If you're going to, yes, you can go and you can be there and see this extraordinary dance by these people and do it. But if you don't have everything lined up, it's not going to work. So, um, and you mentioned tech, and I thought about this a little bit. There was an incredible professor named Phil Adler, who is legendary in the School of Management. And I remember him just like so many management graduates do, because he taught, he taught kind of a combination of strategic planning and human relations. Okay. And I think a lot of what he imbued in me uh, Strategic planning was a big part of my business career. Uh, it, it very essential thing, and so I, I I think that other professors did a good job, but him he's the one you remember. And so I think when I'm when I've done a good job of organizing and preparing and being ready for the moment, uh, people like Phil Adler made a big difference. I love how you can point back to a specific prof professor. You can say, like, oh, because of this person, I can do X, Y, Z. And speaking of the preparation and planning, can you tell me a time or has there been a time when so much work went into a shoot or a trip and it didn't turn out the way you thought it was going to turn out or you were delighted at how it did? Um, I'm very fortunate. Uh, some people say you make your own luck, but, you know, um, We've had, you know, some inclement weather and we've had, you know, different things happen. But part of being an adventure photographer, maybe is the way you think of me, um, is just just getting through it. Whatever it is, just get up and go fight on it and come back and, and, and make it work. You, you can't crumple and whine and cry and, you know, go away. So in general... Uh, I've never, there's, I've never come back from a trip and said, oh, there's this whole thing that I blew, <laughs> that it went away because of weather or because I screwed up my camera settings or whatever. You lose a few shots here and there. That's just a piece of the world. But in general, um, uh, I've not had that. And once again, planning is a piece of, I spent a, a great deal of effort deciding where to go and who to go with, which expert photographer. So all that research makes sure that there is the opportunity that you hope for when you get there. Um, and then you just sort of put up with the, the, the ruggedness and the bad luck and, and power on through it. Exactly. And I can imagine as a photographer, you know, you have an idea of what you want to shoot, but it can be so much more than that. You can come back with shooting things you didn't even think you were. So that's probably the beauty of it. You never can be quite disappointed in what you find. Yes. Well, you have an itinerary, you know, where you're going and sort of if you're going to go to a festival and so forth. And mm -hmm. you can go online and get some idea of what the stuff looks like. Mm -hmm. But um, things in the world, just especially in the third world, just happen when they're going to happen and the way they're going to happen. And so you really have to be able to instantaneously adjust and, and 
they'll start some fantastic dance routine. You have no idea what's coming next. You don't know whether this is going to last 60 seconds or 10 minutes. And you've got to somehow get your shots in there and just manage the situation. So it, and, and there's two skills. One is seeing where to go, where the, you're, you're approaching something and you see where to, where the photograph is going to be mm -hmm. and you get your body and your camera in position to capture it. Uh, and then you work the shutter to capture the exact moment. That's that people have told me, you know, you got some skills. Composition is one of them. And the other is capturing the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, be that in the middle of a fantastic fast dance or just uh, sitting in front of someone like you and taking a careful portrait and trying to capture who they are. So capturing the moment is something that, uh, that I work on and, and seem to have some luck, good luck with. And I can attest to that. You've walked me through your exhibit at Georgia Public Broadcasting, and you have a new one up now uh, called One World, One Us. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you and your curator um, decided on what to, what to present? Yeah. Well, first, I want to thank uh, Taya Ryan and Bert Huffman for their confidence in allowing me to create the George LeBert Gallery mm -hmm. at Georgia Public Broadcasting, and we're into our fourth year there. And the new exhibit you just talked about is our sixth exhibit. Um, and this has really been a huge breakthrough, Lizzie, because um, very few professional photographers have this kind of exhibit opportunity, mm -hmm. and virtually no amateurs do. I, I, <laughs> I may be almost you know, on an island here. Um, and because, and I've been able to work with Susan Todd Rocky, who I want to pay tribute to, my curator. And so she has taught me how to, we, we, we choose a theme, we agree on it, mm -hmm. and then I go put up however many dozen potential images, and then we narrow them down to the two dozen we're going to use. Mm -hmm. um, and then I work very carefully to, you know, perfect them. But it, it all is, is part of a, you know, a, a, telling a story to the visitors. Uh, someone said that all human communication is about telling stories and drawing pictures. In oh, essence. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what we're trying to do with our exhibit. And um, this particular one is designed, One World, One Us, to, to exhibit how whatever our variation around the planet, we are, in fact, all part of the human race. And we have lives that, in fact, are very similar at its essence. And there are things that bind us together. And we hope through these images that we sort of uh, display that, how we, we are all brothers and sisters in this thing. Yeah. Um, can people go through that now for those watching? Are you allowed to visit it? Okay. Yes, ma'am, you can. If you go online, you can see the directions to get there and the parking instructions and stuff like that and uh it's 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 in a wing of the lobby off by itself and so you know there's really probably not going to be anybody else there if you go to visit um but it's it's been a wonderful experience as a photographer to to analyze your body of work and bring out some images and tell a story and do it i think we've got a pretty professional result there and so I'm very proud of it. Um, yeah, I, can, I cannot wait to go to see it. Um, and fortunately, the first time I went, I had you. So you got to tell me the background <laughs> of every photo. And I was I could have listened for hours about, you know, how you got that shot and what made that person do what they were doing. It, it was truly fantastic. So anyone who's watching, please go um, see the exhibit at Georgia Public Broadcasting. It's right down the street from Tech. So in a fantastic spot, I must say. So can you talk about how your work has evolved and the changes you've seen in yourself um, since you started photography? Yeah. Um, I started like everybody else, just taking pictures. And I think the real, real influence for me, Lizzie, was reading National Geographic magazine back in the 1950s and 60s. In those days, 
there was nothing on television, and certainly we had no such thing as the internet. <clears throat> Excuse me. So National Geographic was our window into the exotic world that was out there. And they had this set of fantastic adventure photographers that went out there and brought it, you know, into the magazine. And I think that today that still is lingering around as a, as a motivator and a model for me. And I have worked with and traveled with a good number of the very best National Geographic photographers and seen their skill and had them teach me personally. And you study others' work in photography to see what's possible and what are, what are the creative ideas and what are the techniques that you can use to bring something really special to, to the viewer. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, starting back, as I said, I had taken pictures on the trips starting when we were, you know, 20-something years ago uh, and just kind of worked at it, enjoyed it. But then that trip around the world is when I got really serious and said, I, you know, I'm going to become the best I can be. I have no illusions. I'm not a professional photographer, never will be. Uh, but I, my work is good enough, it seems, to interest people. And that's that's all I'm really about. It's And it's magical. I mean, all this really exploded, say, in my mid-60s. <laughs> and not many people have this wonderful opportunity to have a whole new piece of life, you know, come to you. Uh, it's, it's, it's a gift. I think you show that it's never, I mean, it sounds cliche, but it's never too late to, to start pursuing something that you enjoy or that you think you might have a real talent in. I think you're the perfect example of that. Thank you. Thank you. It's been, it's been a real gift, especially in the pandemic. Oh my goodness. Uh, to, you know, to curate my work and I post to Facebook and Instagram kind of every other day. And I put both images and little stories out there. I've sort of figured out what people enjoy. And I get some feedback, which is very, uh, very fulfilling mm -hmm. to know that people are enjoying it and keep in touch with people. It's one, one way to sort of communicate with friends when we're, you know, we're isolated and, and locked up in our bunkers and whatever. <laughs> exactly. I know and seeing, I know we talked a little bit about the other day a lot of what you've been doing during the pandemic because you can't travel and go on uh, new trips and new projects you have so many photographs that you can go through and curate and share and i would imagine right now that people are really enjoying seeing those photos you know i i follow you on instagram i love seeing the pictures and it's kind of a a reminder that we will once get out there again and we will be traveling and and life will hopefully resume to normal. So it's, it's, it's been such a treat to see those photos that you've taken. Um, Thank you, Lizzie. Yeah, of course. Um, I do want to ask you, since we kind of shifted to the pandemic, um, are you finding yourself, since you, as you call yourself an adventure photographer, have you been taking photos, you know, at home? Or have you been doing that? Or are you sort of biding your time until it's time to get out there again? Uh, no, I haven't. <laughs> I'm a weird kind of guy. I get such a thrill out of traveling to these exotic places and meeting these people and seeing these ceremonies and taking pictures. <clears throat> I, I, I'm not a pure photographer. I, I'm not interested in going out and photographing the old school bus and trying to you know, make that an interesting thing. The other thing to realize is that I am a people photographer. Mm -hmm. I take landscapes and I've got some nice landscapes that sort of happen as part of the process. But that's not, I, I'm never going to take a trip where the whole point is landscape photography. It's, everybody's different. Some, right. There's plenty of people that love to do that and take wonderful pictures. I love human beings. And I learn, and I especially like human beings I, that are very different from me. I've never met them. In, in a lot of cases, I've got all of, you know, 12 seconds to get this photo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I have been mostly working off of my library and I have time now to go back and reanalyze it and perfect some things and spend more energy really putting up stuff on Facebook and Instagram 
uh, in, including in creating little uh, videos. Mm -hmm. I have figured out how to do things with music and voiceover and fade in and fade out and all the techniques that you see in Ken Burns' work. And so I'm, I'm working now on getting more proficient with video, which is a new, another creative outlet. You know, mm -hmm. photography is creative in getting the image and then editing it. But with video, there's a you can do everything that Steven Spielberg can do, yeah, to a, to a slightly lesser degree. Um, and so it's it's all about enjoying your creative opportunity. Yeah, exactly. Um, something you just said stuck out to me, and I wanted to ask: It's you are a people photographer, and if say you're in a crowd of people, you're somewhere exotic, a place that you've been dreaming of going, what, what draws you to one person over somebody else? Is it, can you share kind of what's going through your head and you're like, I want to get this shot right now of this person? Um, it, that does happen. And if I knew the answer to that question, I could probably sell it for a lot of money. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, it does happen. I will go into a marketplace and there will be you know, 100 people there, okay? And I scan the marketplace, every face that's there. And there's something about a particular person that I say, there's the photograph. They mm -hmm. have a face, they have a costume, they have a personality, some combination of all those things. Um, and I realize that's, that's where I need to go. Mm -hmm. And then I began to think through how to position myself and where the light is and where the background is and how to approach them. And in a lot of places, they don't speak my language and I don't certainly don't speak theirs. And you learn how to communicate non-verbally to sort of approach the person in a friendly way and um, get to know them a little bit. I usually keep my camera behind my back on my strap and just engage with them. And if they're selling something, maybe I'll even buy something, you know, but talk to them in, in a way you can. And then at some point, introduce the camera in my hand and ask if I, you know, I try it. The best thing is I got a guide there beside me. Mm -hmm. And I say, tell this lady, she has a beautiful face and I would love to take her picture and show my friends and then bring my camera up and capture the photo. And that's sort of the process that, you use over and over. But the your original question is, it's instinctive. And I don't really think there's, there's rules A, B, and C. You simply look at the combination of the, the, the face, the costume, and mm -hmm. expressions and everything, and make a judgment. This is, this is where the photo is. Have you ever had anyone who says no, that they don't want their photo taken? It, it, I'm very lucky because it's pretty rare. Okay. Um, okay. Th there's a there's a lot of sort of urban stuff about people's culture says you can't capture my photo. It takes my soul and all this. I have just really never run into. There's some places where people are more I think just friendly in general, um, and um, it's just rare, rare rare that people say no. Many okay. of the places I go, they may not have seen a westerner in months. Okay. Because we're we're so far off the path, I can't explain it to you. Right. So I'm just as exotic to them as they are to me. Okay. They're fascinated. Here comes these Westerners, tall Westerners. You are <laughs> with tall. Big yeah. camera, you know, and they're interested in me here in my village, doing what I've been doing, you know, my whole life. Mm -hmm. And so they're pretty fascinated. They're flattered. Mm -hmm they're flattered that someone thinks that they are interesting enough right. to be captured in a photo. And if, and if you use this great person to person skill or routine, whatever you want to call it, uh, most people really want to open up. Uh, but you better be ready because the first few seconds of the opportunity are the best. Sometimes you can work a situation and take a picture over and over, but the spontaneity of the first few frames is what you what you really want to capture. Okay, that's good to know. It's always so a tip you would give. I was going to ask if you have any. My next question was if you have any tips from taking a good photo to a great photo. So one of them would be 
it's like the first few moment, moments of it is when you're going to get the best stuff. Yeah, exactly. I think for people that are just sort of casual photographers, there's a few basic things. Okay. Like I said earlier, when you see a situation, figure out how you want to approach it and frame it. And so you're starting to look for where's the background. You want a good background. You don't want something full of junk or whatever. You're trying to find a, a beautiful or simple or meaningful background. Um, where's your light? You definitely want the light coming on a person's face, either directly or from the side, but not behind them unless you're shooting an you know, effect, effect type place. And then composition wise, you usually use the rule of thirds. You just you, you make uh, this little matrix and you put people in a in an off center position that's interesting. Uh, okay. And the the most fundamental thing I could tell people that don't take you know too much effort on photography is get closer. <laughs> Every photograph that everybody takes and they're back here and there's all this room and space and junk. Totally. Almost impossible to get too close if you're shooting people is the way to think about it. If you really, so right. <laughs> intimate photographs are very interesting. Now, it, it goes to an extreme because people take selfies and you can't see anything but their nose, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's but true. A, but when you have the opportunity, you know, you, you, you're composing what you want someone to look at. It has mm -hmm. to be clear that this is the focus of the picture here. Mm -hmm. And so taking out distractions is, a, is an important thing. Totally. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use that then when I, the next time I take pictures, because I'll tell you what, I'm a terrible photographer. So <laughs> hopefully I do a little bit better next time. So I want to get to um, some of the questions that have been pre-submitted. And the first one was, how did you make it to 80 countries? Um, and how, how do you think that affects your photography kind of, all together cumulative going forward um i think that's maybe what they're asking has all of these places you've been to affected it yeah well my wife and i travel with friends um uh, for 17 years or something like that it was very fortunate to be able to travel with friends but and and, and that was covering europe in general I, although i got the group to peru and to morocco and egypt and places like that because that's I knew that's what I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, then when I determined I wanted to see cultures, exotic cultures, and I wanted to get better, there's a whole, there's a list of places you want to go if you study this carefully. Right. And so I sort of had this, this wish list of places to go. And starting um, <clears throat> seven, eight years ago, I started working my way through these things and taking like three big trips a year and so forth. The challenge now is I have exhausted pretty much all the obvious places to go. And so I have to become really creative and thoughtful about the next trip that will be as exciting and interesting as these others have been. So there's a, it, it's hard to overemphasize the amount of research and thought you have to put into mm -hmm. figuring out where to go uh, and when to go and who to go with and so forth. Uh, but that's that's that in, that's an investment that pays off uh, by not wasting a huge amount of money and time and everything and getting somewhere that's really not interesting or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Well, that leads me to one of the uh, another question that was submitted. What is the most rewarding project you've worked on? And since this is two pronged, since we are, I don't know how we talked for this long already. I could go on for so much longer. Um, where, when it's safe to travel again, what is the next place on your list? Okay. Um, well, let me take the second question first. I have missed three photographic expeditions this year, and another one that will come in January uh, was going to go to Antigua, Guatemala for Holy Week. They have these incredible ceremonies at night and so forth. Um, was going to go to Romania, uh, where life is as it was a hundred years ago, way out in the forest, uh, and was going to go to Zimbabwe on a special uh, safari there. Okay. And then next January was going to go to the Voodoo Festival in Benin and Ghana. Okay. So what I'm doing at this point is rolling those trips forward. 
I've, okay. you know, I've signed up for all of that in 21. And then if they, if I can't go or they're not, they'll just keep rolling forward. So I know the four destinations for sure. But then as you see on that list you have in front of you, I have a whole bunch of thoughts about where to go. And I began to qualify which one to select and who to go with and, and so forth. And I, I seek the advice of some of these professional photographers that have shot the world over and over and um, seek out you know, their thoughts about what would be the next great place to go. And I, I got worried when they started thinning out that, geez, maybe I'm going to get to the end of the road and there's not going to be another place. But it turns out that there's special places, special tribes stuck off in parts of the world that you don't, if you don't study the way I do, you'll never know about them. Right. So uh, I've, I've come to the conclusion that a new, a new door will open as you, as you pass through them. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. So the, you're never afraid of having running out of places to go to. There will always be some new, fascinating place to, to go to, right? I believe so. I've come to believe that. I like that. I like that. Well, George, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I know we're going to have some comments um, in the chat box if that your questions have not been answered. We will get to them. We'll talk to George later, hopefully, and hopefully he can answer any questions that you have. Um, it's a pleasure talking to you, George. Um, and thank you so much. This was fantastic. Well, Lizzie, I want to thank you and Georgia Tech Arts for this opportunity. It's very flattering. Um, and it's also, but it's a contributor to Georgia Tech Arts, which is a very dear thing to me. Um, I think our purpose when we created the Arts Advisory Council was to bring the arts to the young men and women at Georgia Tech so they can become a complete person as God intended. That is what I believe our mission is, and hopefully this is a tiny piece of that. I, George, I think you just summed up this whole, <laughs> what we're doing with the Sears better than I could. So I'm just going to leave this on a high note and, <laughs> and sign off. Thank you so much um, for everyone who's watching. If you have anyone in mind that you want us to highlight, please let me know. Um, and we'd be happy to do so. Um, as always, stay safe, stay healthy, and go Jackets.